Professor Lee, thank you very much for your introduction. First of all, I'd like to say a very big thank you and gratitude to Dr. Wang, Wang Feng, who invited me, and various people who organized this meeting, including uh, uh, Linda, uh, Vivian, and uh, Park, who has organized my travel and uh, so many of our lives here with you. Today, um, I'm going to talk about rice because I spent 25 years at the International Rice Research Institute. I'm almost like the, the rice gene has been built. Um, it will be about how do we enhance and protect the biological services. Biological services. First, I'd like to say what I'm going to talk about, so just in case I run out of time, to at least we have a summary. First, I'd like to say that rice ecosystem services, aspect, rice ecosystems in Asia are richly endowed with hundreds and thousands of biological populations. Pests, especially pest outbreaks, often only occur when there's a disruption of the service. Normally, rice grow normally, do not have problems. Insecticide misuse is one of the root cause of many of the outbreaks. Now, to enhance and protect biological control uh, services in rice fields, ecological engineering, which has been introduced by uh, Professor Joseph Satterley, and uh, we'll be discussing this later by Steve Broughton, Breton, is one of the ways to restore and put, uh, biodiversity. However, in addition to that, the reforming of pesticide marketing regulations, especially in Asia, and parts of Asia where I live, is of vital importance. Because as you build, restore biodiversity, there are big elements destroying them. Unless this two balance occurs, we are not going to do very well. And thirdly, I will talk a little bit about motivating farmers. Because biodiversity restoration and also conservation is likely to be performed individually by millions of farmers. Not by me, not by anyone else sitting here. It is the farmers who are going to do it. And there must be motivation for them to do something that is beneficial to them. First statement I'm going to say is we, for many years, looking at rice and productivity, we found that rice farmers in Asia, most parts of Asia, has little or no productivity gain from insecticide use. Okay, that is a very strong statement. Pesticide companies do not like it, but I have data to show that every cent they spend on insecticide is a complete waste. We have conducted farm surveys, farm records of more than 5,500 farmers in Vietnam, in the Mekong Delta, and each time we plot you and number of sprays the farmer used, we get this straight line. Completely no relationship. So what you see here is a farmer who sprays nothing and a farmer who spray eight times has the same yield. The only difference is the farmer who spray eight times spend eight times more money. That's the, the only thing that happens to him. And, and uh, later on I'll describe why so many people are stuck in this uh, trap. I'm an entomologist, so I will talk a little bit about it. Now, one interesting insect that I worked many years on is this pink floor rice leaf folder. Now, this leaf folder invades the rice as an adult early in the crop, about 40 days or so. He folds and scrapes leaves. He have, and in his whole life, he can only leave, he can only consume 25 square centimeters of the leaf if you leave it alone in good condition. Usually, you only find one or two now. 
So the question we always ask is, are these pests, but it's listed as pests, but if we were to define pests the way most economic entomologists define it, not every insect is a pest, that is a pest is something that causes a loss of benefit. So even a pest, a pest insect can be a non-pest at low, te te low density and become a pest if it is density is high. So it is not about the species, it's about the population. What is the population? So this particular insect uh, is what I'm going to talk a little bit about. Okay. Under normal circumstances, because of the richness in biological control elements in the field, more than 40% of the eggs are eaten up by something. A lot of the eggs are parasitized, and many, many larval parasitoids and generalist predators eat them up. <coughs> this is a common sight in most of them. This is from Vietnam, most parts of Asia. Insecticide use is very rampant. They they, whenever they see these small patches of the rice fields attacked by these pests, the farmer goes out there and spray his crop. There are two things I want you to know in this farmer spraying the crop which is a common thing. He's spraying the crop at the early crop stages. Those of us who know rice plants know that the early crop damages of rice, the plant will recover because of high compensation abilities. So those damages means nothing because those leaves that are damaged at this stage eventually filter away and do not have do not produce any productive uh, tillers. Secondly, is spraying on top of the uh, and and the and the caterpillars or pests are not on top; they are at the bottom. And thirdly, one of the most uh, important thing is the equipment most people use in uh, Asia, most parts of Asia, are inadequate. They are poor equipment. They have very large nozzle size, so therefore deliver large droplets into the, uh, from, the, from the nozzle. And those of us who know about spray equipment, large droplets literally roll into the water. So 95 or more percent of whatever the farmer use rolls into the water and do not actually which most of the target. We once did a, a piece of research to look at if farmers spray for lip fauna, what will be the vulnerability of this crop to, to something else later in the stage. We found that if farmers were to spray for lip fauna early in the crop stages, he, will, he or she will have tenfold increase in the probability of getting a hopper burn. Hopper burn is caused by another insect uh, called the plant hopper. So farmers who spray for leaf fodder are um, vulnerable to attack by plant hoppers. This is the dramatic, uh, uh, diagrammatic uh, illustration of what I mean. Generally, if fields ecosystem services begin to develop as the, as the crop matures. However, if farmers are beginning to spray his crop at early stages, it destroy those ecosystem services. And, that, and at, if at that time hoppers invade his field, those hoppers will enjoy exponential growth facilities and therefore becomes outbreak conditions. One reason why is because all the, net, all the biological control elements have been destroyed. And the farmer is spraying for something that doesn't really get him any year. So therefore, we are very convinced the plant hopper problems in Asia is an induced problem, induced by insecticide use. And this is the worst pest in Asia. And the worst pest is really not really a pest unless something else. The root cause of this pest is insecticide misuse. 
under natural conditions, you will find that the eggs of these plant hoppers are laid into inside the stems. And these eggs can only be reached by two species that we know of. One is the parasitoid that has that can pierce into the eggs, and the other one is an egg predator that can penetrate those tissues and get at the eggs. And here's a diagram to illustrate what happens. If the farmer spray, those eggs will never be touched. What the farmer did when he sprays is the diversity has been destroyed, and when the eggs hatch, the little statement here, the, 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 these little creatures that come out will enjoy a free range of food and with no enemies. And that's how the outbreaks occur. If you've seen those outbreaks, it's very scary. This is the kind of things that you see when outbreaks occur. And these brown patches occur for miles and miles uh, across, the, uh, across the countryside. This is the bottom here. This is the little creature. In addition to directly feeding and destroying crops, they carry virus problems. So the first season, you have a hopper bird destruction. And when the farmer plows his land and grow again, next thing he gets is virus. So for two seasons, farmers will suffer direct loss because of this uh, pest problem. What is occurring in Asia today, and at, in respective to insecticide use, is, is escalation of insecticide use. From 1990 to about now, this is a part of Indonesia. Indonesian government has imported insecticides 5,000 percent, more than more, 5,900 percent more. There is no increase in rice production, or little increase in rice production. There is also no increase in pest problem. The only increase in pest problem they get is more brown front outbreaks occurring. <coughs> The, ask, the question we want to further ask is why is there sudden import, such huge import? The only justification is there were a lot of pests, but there were no such pests. Uh, and this kind of pattern, maybe this is an extreme case in Indonesia, but this kind of pattern is very common in many uh, Southeast Asian countries. In many Southeast Asian countries, pesticide are sold by multi-tier marketing to downline sub dealers If you know what I mean by uh, uh, this marketing costway and uh, M-way system, where they, where you have different tiers, this is how pesticides are being sold, not through licensing or or certified dealers. And in, I, in this particular case, this is Indonesia. This is the man selling the pesticide. He is managing a little shop. And all he gets is four bottles of pesticide from a, a sub, sub, sub dealer somewhere to be placed in his store. And he displays them among some sweets and, and many other things. There's no rule against it. Man. He is, uh, I'm from Malaysia, so I speak the language. So I asked him, why do you place this near the food? He said, I have no other place to place this. Uh, that was his reason. <laughs> and incidentally, the day I visited him, there was a farmer who came to the shop and told him he had a problem. And he was saying he had a brown front of a problem. And he asked him, what should I do? And he just picked up one of the bottles and said, use this. And I said, what did you give him? And I, I looked at it, and, and I, later on, when the, and the man, he took it away without paying, and he just write down in a little book. Typical way in rural areas where credit is provided. Uh, 
And when the farmer walked away, I asked him, why did you give him that? It doesn't work. He said, that's the only one I have. And also, that one is very popular. <laughs> so, almost by default, these agents, these sub-dealers, become the pest management advisor. And in all these places, no extension is ever going to reach the farmer. So, as I said, the biological control, the most of the pests in mice ecosystems are maintained by the biological control. It's only when they are disturbed they have problems. And one of the things that we started looking into is more sustainable means, and the thing we developed, we labeled it ecological engineering. What ecological engineering entails is to aim at two things restore the biodiversity and conserve the biodiversity. In the restoring of the biodiversity, we started growing other plants. And the conservation of the biodiversity, we provide simple rules to say, certain period of your crop, you don't need to spray. And the simple rule was, first 40 days of your crop, you do not need to spray at all. And, and first 40 days is attacked by the owners. So leave the leaf holders alone, and, and uh, it will be one of the instructions. And this will then build more species diversity, ecosystem function, and ecosystem services. A short way to remember this, why these farms around the rice is important, is this something that uh, Professor Gerd uh, uh, once told, advised us, you say you snap your fingers. One, shelter, nectar, alternate poles, and pollen. What this plant provide are these important things to maintain biological control. In rice, the first, the first experiment in rice that we used when we started this was in a place called Chinua, in Chichang province. Here, we started using sesame. Sesame as the main sort, the main uh, uh, plant in the, in the rice area. Now sesame is, is, a, is a nice little plant that provides this kind of uh, properties. One, it, because it flowers all the year round. And the, fl the flowers are rich in nectar and attracts many uh, hymenopterans and uh, butterflies to it. And also, at the end of the season, farmers can harvest and have some sesame seed for sale. Using some um, support from the Asian Development Bank, we managed to create a multi-country uh, ex experiment. This is one of the experiments we created. Uh, so the same experiment was done in Chinua, China, in Thailand, Tianjin where we looked at, uh, for four years, where we looked at various elements about growing some flowers near the rice field and what are the effects. And here are the results. The number of sprays is reduced. Yields increase on average. 70% reduction in insecticide sprays, about 5% increase in yield general. And pest populations were lower. The yellow line is the pest population of the ecological engineering fields. And egg parasites, parasitoids increase. Such in, in Vietnam, you will, now you will, if you visit parts of Vietnam, you will see a lot of rice fields looking like this, with flowers growing. Now, uh, as I said, the custodian of biodiversity and maintenance of biodiversity will not be us, it will be farmers. It will be the millions of farmers. The negative side of this particular uh, phenomenon is that it falls into the region of 
culturally not important because they don't know what it is, and hard to see. They can't see parasites, they can't see ecosystem service, and because they don't know what they are, so culturally they are not important. And as such, it is extremely difficult to communicate to rural farmers about ecosystem service and about egg parasitoids. So we have to find innovative ways to do this. One of the innovative ways we developed was to, to enable farmers to appreciate parasitoid was to associate parasitoids with bees. So, because bees are bigger and easier to see, and farmers are, we then taught farmers how to observe bees and use it as an indicator. And since, and, and introduced the, the concept of parasitism. Parasitism is not a concept in rural folk. They, they, we used to talk about this to the farmers and said, oh, this little creature lays an egg in another insect, and the egg develops and comes out as, as a, a, another fly. That kind of concept is completely alien to a lot of rural folks. So we created a name for the parasitoid because they have no name. We call them small flies, small bees, small bees. <coughs> and in China, we call, Xiaofeng, we call it, uh, we created a word called Xiaofeng and used that word communicate uh, 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 parasitization. We created, from there, created three simple rules. Just, uh, how farmers, or most people think about decision is using simple rules. They don't analyze situations very thoroughly. So we create three simple rules. Flowers on the buns provide food to attract bees and small bees. Right? The bees and small bees will help us, help me, farmer, control hopper invading my field, so I don't need to spray insecticide. If I spray insecticides, it will kill the bees and small bees. So these three information bits or rules are then communicated through media. One of the biggest reach, fastest and most inexpensive way to reach people is for media. And we developed uh, posters like this, emphasizing the B is their main, uh, uh, and as their, as the, an important element to protect. Some of these are posters like this. In Vietnam, this is called Kong Ni Sing Thai, which is equivalent to ecological engineering. Now, Vietnam not only used these posters to display all over the country, they also launched big campaigns with ministers and, wise and, and provincial governors as the people who launched them, and created a series we call Entertainment Education Series, which I will explain how this is created, and TV series, uh, which uh, Professor Joseph said talked about it just now. And this TV series is broadcast over the, over the television in, in the region. There's several campaigns. And here you see here uh, in one province, they had a campaign with motorcycle parade around the street, around the area, with all the signs and, and bees, and, uh, and posters, uh, and also pamphlets like this describing bees. Not only that, they tried, to be, they tried to engage more people involved. So on 8 March 2012, those ladies, you know what it is, 8 March? 8 of March is the International Women's Day. On 8 March, this province decided that they will try to engage the women in this, in this process, and on 8 March, launch the Women in Ecological Engineering project. Uh, the idea was to engage the women in this uh, 
growing of flowers. Why the women? Through our discussions and uh, farm visits, we begin to learn that some of the men were quite reluctant to grow flowers. We asked the men, why don't you grow some flowers? Uh, to, and then you don't have to spray. He said, no, I'm not going to grow some flowers because my friend laughed at me. I'm going to spray. You know, that kind of macho and I said, well, you, you, save some, you save some money by not spraying. Isn't that good? No, I know those flowers, they, they, I can't sell them, so I have no profit. But when you ask the women, what about growing some flowers and saving sprays? The women said, good idea. You grow some flowers and save sprays. I said, is there any benefit? I said, of course there's benefit. I saved the spray, and that's a profit. There are two ways, there seems to be two ways of looking at what the profit is. The men want something physical money, returning, whereas the women look at profit as something they don't spend saving as a profit. So from that day, from that day we actually decided that we'll go and, and, and engage the women more in this particular case. And, and also they all love the flowers around their house and around the whole room area. And as a result, you can see the, uh, large areas in Vietnam uh, with this kind of uh, flowers around the fields. The other thing we engaged to try and conserve and protect and spread the ecological engineering was something we call ecologic uh, entertainment education. This is a process where you use to entertain and also educate, and so that audience who create a favorable attitude and shift the norm. Growing flowers, we want to move growing flowers to be the norm, the norm thinking. I grow rice, I grow flowers, to, to be the norm. That was the idea. So we created a uh, television series. This television series was created very specifically to entertain uh, rural folks. We employed four comedians, so making learning fun. So these four comedians will have conversations uh, in the field about ecological engineering and laughing at each other and, and so on. So they are every week, one episode. We did this for 20, 40 weeks. And each week after the conversation, uh, uh, the concept is introduced. They may be laughing at each other and, and teasing each other about an idea, and somebody will come and explain what that means, the parasitoids and so on. And also an opportunity in the television to show some films about parasites. Our whole idea is to introduce farmers to the human. What that created was a change in belief. The belief that flowers on the buns can attract bees and parasitoids to protect my rice, the viewers had an increased number of viewers believe that and, and correspondingly several statements. We tried to monitor change in attitude and belief through belief statements that are presented to farmers. And practice. You see that the viewers and non-viewers had a significant change in seed rate they use, nitrogen rate they use, and the average insecticide they use. The average insecticide of the viewers reduced by 24% in this particular case. And yields were relatively the same. Now in the Theory of plant behavior, which is a psycho psychological the psychology theory, it is not just beliefs or peer pressure or control that decide that determine uh, intention alone. So they may be positive belief, positive peer pressure, and positive uh, control, therefore influencing intention to perform something. But there is still a last barrier. And last barrier, last barrier to adoption is something we call perceived barrier. What is the perceived barrier of uh, 
to adopt. It is important for us to find out what the perceived barrier so that we can try to remove those barriers to facilitate the adoption. One of the perceived barriers, the one in the white, that, that is significant for us was flowers on the bun will, will die when I burn my straw after harvest. And every season he burns his straw. So he said, why should I plant flowers? They all die. The other one was buns are for walking, not for flowers. That attitude. Our oh, buns are for walking. I don't want to grow any flowers there. And the buns are too narrow to do, for me to grow flowers. These remain very strong barriers to adoption. So we need to find ways to, to uh, uh, change these barriers. And one of the ways uh, we found, and we'll talk about it later, to change this to change these barriers. This is only this uh, ecological engineering TV won a gold gold medal award in a, in the television festival in Vietnam. And this series has led us to launch another series uh, funded through the Nagato project. And this time, we use the International Day of Biodiversity as the launching pad. Similarly, you see changes in beliefs in one year after the television program of between viewers and non-viewers. Now I want to uh, discuss a little bit about what are those key threats ahead of us, in, especially in Southeast Asia, that are threatening sustainable pest management and uh, biodiversity. Pest information are mostly unregulated in the supply chain. They are completely dominated by the industry. Farmer hear more about a pesticide than ecological engineering or parasite. That's not the, the kind of domination. And claims of how successful certain pesticides are are completely not dominated, uh, regulated, and therefore you have a lot of false claims. Pesticide regulatory frameworks in many of these countries are extremely weak. As a result, pesticides are being sold as fast-moving consumer goods. Fast-moving FMCG, fast-moving consumer goods, is like toothpaste, uh, uh, soap, and things like that, which are very fast-moving consumers. And so you can imagine pesticides being sold as one of those items. And they are sold in multi-tier marketing scheme with a lot of sales incentives. In Indonesia, if you sell a huge if you sell sufficient volume, the retailer are given a trip to Mecca as a gift. And all kinds of uh, in sales incentives are provided at all levels. Product marketing, products marketing in hundreds of trade names. You don't know about Taiwan. I mean, here in literally hundreds. Of one single product is market in the market are found in hundreds of different names. It is impossible for farmers to know what they are using. And also, there is generally lack of policy support for, and most of the policies of uh, Southeast Asian government favor the marketing rather than the health or uh, the environment or organic or, or, or all the substance with sustainable agriculture and all the things we talk about. That is the kind of threats I think we, we need to think about. And even in this one, these are the important threats. Non-technical in nature, but they are very strong threats to, to adoption. Now I'd like to share with you some experiences from South Korea. South Korea in 1994 enacted something they call Environmental Friendly Agriculture Act and followed through several other activities including one recently launched 
called the Insect Industry Promotion Act. Yeah, these, these kind of activities act completely change, uh, change the compensa compensation system. The whole compensation system has been changed. And as a result, as compared to before, rice production was always government driven before. There was always emphasis on increasing production. Pesticides and fertilizer were subsidized and the whole strain was an enforcement. And now, after this act, we find that pesticides and fer fertilizer subsidy has to stop. The government drive is not is towards pesticide reduction and safe and clean production. Pesticide use and marketing distribution is now more regulated in Korea, and the emphasis is on em environmental uh, preservation. This act alone change the landscape in South Korea. Those of you going to South Korea, you see this kind of landscape in South Korea. They did not introduce ecological engineering. Ecological engineering occurred by itself. What you see here is sesame and uh, soya bean being grown by the farmer water and flowers. Fertilizer drop and insect pesticide use in rice drop. The happy part I'm, I'm beginning to note in Vietnam is this payment of environmental services, ES is often called by economists, is beginning to happen in some provinces. This is an example of one province that has now adopted the, the uh, principle of paying farmers to plant flowers. They will pay farmers according to how many meters of flowers they plant. As, and what he's doing is he's using the budget which he had used before for pesticide uh, distribution. So it's a shift of the subsidy of, of the budget in his uh, 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 provincial budget. So what we can hope to see, we are beginning to see in Vietnam are changes in the landscape, the typical changes in the landscape that are occurring in Vietnam. Now, on final note, I'd like to uh, say something about this. It's about plant protection, how plant protection is being organized in this part of the world. Plant protection servi services have uh, developed in 1950s. They are based on fire brigade service. Go fight the fire. But even today, fire brigade service have evolved into fire prevention, not fighting fire you find fire brigade services about fire prevention. But in plant protection services in most of Asia, we still change them. We still organize to fight pests. We need a reform of such system. New plant protection services need to be based on preventing pests occurring through ecological design and structure, like what we talked about, rather than fight pests. Thank you very much.